Welcome to section 6 on miscellaneous topics and the course summary. This section contains a handful of topics that I've been requested to cover, and it contains a blend of general concepts and some new TensorFlow developments. First, we'll take a quick look at Tensor Processing Units, or TPUs, Google's high-performance machine learning chips, and that's the subject of this video. Next, we'll go over the concepts behind automated machine learning, also called AutoML, which aims to automate processes like hyperparameter tuning and model selection. Then, we'll work through some examples using TensorFlow Eager, which is a new imperative style interface to TensorFlow, still in the experimental stages. It feels more like NumPy or PyTorch compared to TensorFlow, where we define our graph computation and then it all executes at once, which is a declarative approach. We'll wrap up the section and the course with a summary video and considerations for next steps in improving your TensorFlow understanding. Today is all about tensor processing units, or TPUs for short. We'll start off by comparing the relative strengths and weaknesses of CPUs versus GPUs for deep learning, and then we'll ease our way into tensor processing units, going over the architecture and some uh, interesting characteristics and benchmarks. Lastly, we'll wrap up with getting TPU access, which at this time is admittedly a, a bit limited. So before diving into tensor processing units, it's good to have some background as to what's the difference between CPUs versus GPUs for deep learning. GPUs, after all, are one of the main reasons that we have this deep learning renaissance that we're currently in, and it's important to know kind of the architectural differences between CPUs and GPUs that motivated this huge explosion for deep learning. Starting off with CPU, apologies for the somewhat grainy looking image here. I'm taking these from the CUDA C programming guide, link at the bottom of the slide there. CPUs, which stands for Central Processing Unit, are general purpose and they do serial or in series linear computations. Here is a very simplified diagram of a CPU. The top left we have control, which is the components that are responsible for determining which sequence of operations to execute at any given time. You can think of it like the brains of the CPU. A handful of ALUs. ALU stands for arithmetic logic units. These are responsible for performing the mathematical operations like addition and, or multiplication. And we have cache and DRAM. So cache is more local quick memory and DRAM is a little bit slower, but it's much cheaper so we can have more of it. So let's compare this simplified CPU diagram with a simplified GPU diagram. This uh, highlights the main differences between the two that we're interested at least. So the GPU here, we have the same color scheme going on. The green here is we see a bunch of arithmetic logic units instead of just a handful, and that's because GPUs are really good at data parallelism. That data parallelism is, for example, matrix multiplication operations. And the parallelism we're talking about here arises from the fact that when you do a matrix multiplication, you're using a lot of repeated computations, the same types of computations, and also you are doing those computations over the same pieces of data multiple times. And for that reason, we don't need, since we're just doing special purpose computations, the GPU doesn't need to be able to do all possible general computations that the CPU needs to do. It just needs to do a much smaller subset, but do it much better. So the control units for that are going to be smaller and spread across the GPU because a GPU does the same kinds of operations multiple times at once, in parallel. The ability of a GPU to do many operations in parallel gives it the potential to do an overall larger number of computations per unit time. So one common metric for this is flops. And so here we see gigaflops, which is where flops is floating point operations per second. Giga means billion. So this chart is meant to give us a relative sense of the theoretical gigaflops for GPUs compared to CPUs. GPUs are the green lines and CPUs are the blue lines. For each of the two pairs, the lighter color represents single precision and the darker represents double precision, as given by the legend. Note that the horizontal axis is time, so we're seeing the improvements in hardware from 2003 to 2015, and we're seeing this explosion of GPU performance, which is lending very well to the kind of computations that neural networks demand. And it's always important to remember what theoretical means here because we could have applications that aren't easily parallelized, which is why GPUs are useful for only specific types of applications. They can't just make all of your applications run this much faster or do this much more operations per time for just any application. The types of applications that GPUs will approach this limit most closely are applications that have the highest potential for data parallelism, such as neural networks uh, and deep learning. Another useful metric is uh, memory bandwidth, measured in gigabytes per second. If we are doing all these computations in parallel, it's important that we can push the large amounts of data to and from memory so that 
Otherwise, our throughput would just be as fast as our memory bottleneck. In this graph, the two green lines are different versions of GPUs. One is a GeForce GPU and the other one is Tesla, both NVIDIA GPUs. This is, again, from the CUDA programming guide. And the blue line is an Intel CPU. Again, the horizontal axis is time, and we're seeing a huge explosion in the recent years for the GPUs. Their memory bandwidth shooting up, and some kind of consequences for that for deep learning, for example, is that they can process much larger batch sizes. We can push through much larger amounts of data and computations, matrix multiplications for much larger and larger matrices than before, and that results in overall faster training times. However, things can always be faster, right? So the point of the TPU is to do an even more specialized processing unit for neural networks in particular. GPUs, remember, are graphics processing units. Their original design intention was for processing three-dimensional matrices to render things like video games. It was more of a happy accident that they were also extremely useful for things like deep learning. So the hypothesis, you could say, of the tensor processing unit is, well, let's try a little bit more specialized. Let's see if we can design a processing unit specifically designed for processing neural network applications. So here is an image of the second generation TPU. Google has done this in the first generation was only for inference, and the second one can do both training and inference of models. What you see here is actually four chips. There is a chip under each of the four large heat sinks sticking out of the overall tensor processing unit here. Overall, this thing can do 180 teraflops, so 180 trillion floating operations per second in the theoretical limit, and 64 gigabytes of high bandwidth memory. And at Google, they actually organize these into TPU pods, which is what you're seeing here. So this is 64 of those TPUs, which accumulates in a total of 11.5 petaflops, which is a truly astounding amount of computation, and 4 terabytes total of high bandwidth memory. So when we discuss things like getting access to the Google Compute Engine for using tensor processing units, as well as the TensorFlow Research Cloud, that ultimately these are coming from these t large TPU pods. So let's do a little bit peeking in, just like we did with the CPU and GPU, of the simple diagrams of what the TPU looks like. So I've drawn a circle here because we are about to zoom into one of the four chips on the tensor processing unit. This is the diagram provided. I got this from a slide from a talk by Jeff Dean, who was one of the leaders of this project. This is a diagram for the second generation TPU chip, one of the four that we saw there. And the main components are the high bandwidth memory on either side. We've seen these before. Also MXU, which is the matrix multiplication unit. This is specifically designed for doing matrix multiplications. You know, again, that's the main operation that seems to occur in these neural networks. There's also scalar and vector units being passed back and forth, and the two cores containing both of those for the main computations and operations run when you're processing neural networks. What makes the TPU stand out is how the matrix multiplication unit handles and passes data through to do these matrix multiplication operations. And that is the systolic array, or the idea behind systolic arrays. So we're going to let this GIF play through a few times here. Sorry for the granularity again. This is an illustration of a systolic array processing the matrix multiplication of a matrix W by a vector input X. X has three components. W is a matrix with dimensions 2 by 3. And the output, of course, is then going to be a vector of with two elements, Y. And the idea behind systolic arrays is to minimize the amount of reads and writes going between the registers inside of the TPU. And so that's why the illustration you're seeing kind of the x1, x2, x3 being passed down in sequence. This is meant to illustrate that we are not rereading x1 when we make the computations later on inside of our series of multiplies and adds, because that's all really a multiplication is. It's a series of scalar multiplications added together or accumulating. We see on y1 and y2. y1, for example, is just accumulating a single multiplication operations between the elements of x and the elements of w. And the illustration shows the motivation behind the name of systolic arrays, systolic being reminiscent of blood pumping through a heart. So the data gets kind of pumped through the matrix and to do the matrix multiplication operation. It's always good to see benchmark comparisons for performance between the three contenders here, CPU, GPU, and TPU. We're seeing comparisons for various types of neural network architectures. So we're having the main ones are multi-layer perceptron, or MLP, the LSTMs, we've seen those in previous sections, as well as the CNNs, the convolutional neural networks.
The metrics being compared here is predictions per second. Orange is TPU, red is GPU, and blue is CPU. So we see that it's not a uniform you know, comparison difference between each application. It very much does depend what application or type of neural network component you're using. Um, if you are trying to predict the amount of speed up that a TPU is going to get over your current GPU or CPU setup. In particular, one thing that I really was drawn to being working in the NLP space, it's a lot of LSTMs and GRUs, recurrent neural networks, things like that. And we see that, oh no, for LSTMs, the, uh, the difference between TPU and GPU is not much. And furthermore, CPU and GPU, not much either. So I have a little sad face here to reflect how I feel about these uh, performance benchmarks because I was hoping that I could get a lot more out of the uh, performance of TPUs. And the reason for discrepancy being a little bit less in interesting for LSTMs is the memory bandwidth. TPUs do not have huge amounts of memory bandwidth increase compared to GPUs, and LSTMs require that memory bandwidth. Wrapping up, how can we get access to TPUs ourselves? So right now, mostly this is uh, in-house Google hardware, but they are starting to release this to the public. There are cloud TPUs that are now just being released on Google Cloud Platform, which is currently in beta. They only have a limited number of TPUs uh, that they're releasing to the public, so you have to apply and hear back, but uh, it seems like their intention is to have this release just like any other service on Google Cloud Platform for the public to use, so you will eventually will be able to choose between GPU, CPU, or TPU freely. The other much more exclusive option, but it's there, is the TensorFlow Research Cloud. So this is for the, the world's top researchers, as said by TensorFlow on their website. So you apply here, and if you get accepted, then you get free access to TPUs out of 1,000 TPUs total that are allocated for this TensorFlow Research Cloud. So if you consider yourself a top researcher, then feel free to go to TensorFlow's website and apply for access to the TensorFlow Research Cloud. As always, make sure to read through the links here for an in-depth look at the topics covered today. Coming up next is our video on automated machine learning, or AutoML for short, where we discuss concepts behind automating the processes like hyperparameter searches and model selection.